Hi, I'm Neil Eisman. In 2005, I completed Soul Searcher, described by The Guardian as a fantasy action movie in the grand style. It's a 95 minute feature about an ordinary guy who's trained to be the new Grim Reaper, shot entirely at night. It has numerous martial arts sequences, 280 effect shots, and a climactic chase between a 1973 Ford Mustang and an express train to hell on a total budget of just £28,000. In this program, I'm going to explain where this money came from and exactly how it was spent. We'll also look at the distribution deals I was offered, why I picked the one I did, and the vast ocean of riches I received from it. Right, let's start at the beginning. When the producer and I started work on the project in 2002, we drew up a budget for £60,000 we were intending to pay our key cast and crew, and we approached public funding bodies and production companies. We got nowhere with that, and by summer 2003, I realised the only way to get it made was to pay for a good chunk of it myself. I put a couple of grand into the pot and asked a few other people to contribute, a corporate client and three of my relatives. Each one contributed £500. The investors were given a plain English agreement, which I doubt held any water legally, entitling them to a share of the profits in direct proportion to the amount they invested. So by autumn 2003, I had four grand in the pot, enough with my overdraft and credit card to go ahead with the shoot in October and November. The cast and crew all really believed in the project, so much so that one actor, four crew members, and even a crew member's relative offered to invest. In some cases, this took the form of simply waiving reimbursement of expenses, but in others, they invested hard cash. Around the same time, I was able to persuade many of the original investors to make further contributions, and that brought the investment total to £10,772. Now that's excluding my own contribution, which would ultimately reach £13,251. That summer, during post-production, I was approached by Creative Industries, a department of the local council. Now they'd heard about Soul Searcher, and they suggested that I should apply for funding from them. I did so, successfully, receiving £2,900. Now this was supposed to be for promotion of the finished film, but as post-production costs rose and my personal finances were stretched to breaking point, it became clear that there would be no film to promote unless I used some of the money to complete it. Creative Industries kindly allowed me to do that. Soul Searcher was finally completed in early 2005. The film was screened several times at the Arts Centre local to where it was shot, and a couple of other venues. These screenings made £506, which I reinvested into the project. But in order to seek a distribution deal for the film, I needed to attend the Cannes Film Festival and Market. I applied to Screen West Midlands, the regional screen agency at the time, who had a scheme in conjunction with UK Trade and Industry, whereby they would fund 50% of a filmmaker's costs to go to Cannes. I was successful, largely due to the great coverage Soul Searcher had received in The Guardian, I suspect, and UK Trade and Industry reimbursed me £470 after the trip. So, all in all, £27,899 went into the project. We'll look at how much money the film made in a minute, but first, let's see how all that money was spent. As I go through these figures, here are a few things to bear in mind. I'm talking about a shoot of around 35 days, with a crew that averaged about 10 people. Apart from a scene shot in a nightclub, everything was shot at night. Almost all of the locations were within a small area, the city of Hereford. There were six principal actors, most of whom were London based, so they needed accommodating in Hereford. The shoot crew and supporting cast were all fairly local, but many people who worked solely on pre-production or post-production, prop makers, model makers, effects artists and so on, were based elsewhere in the country and worked with me by phone, email and post. OK, pre-production and admin first. Fairly boring stuff here. Stationery, £41. Printer cartridges and photocopying, £185. Postage, £198. Phone calls, £91. I suspect that was actually more, but I just absorbed a lot of the cost. 
Advertising on Mandy.com for cast and crew, £27. Bank charges, including credit card and overdraft interest, £112. Travel, £79. Subsistence, £32. An audition venue hire, £35. So the total for pre-production was £799. Moving on to the interesting bit, production. Specialist props, i.e. the weapons, Luca's rifle and pistols, her grenades, the swords, the scythes, £270. Remember, I'm just paying the costs here, no one's getting a fee. Other props, £441. Courier to get the props from the prop maker to the set during a postal strike, £118. Makeup costs, including many hideous demons, £441 again. General costumes, £590. Armour for the demons, this is a biggie because we had terrible trouble getting this made to a usable standard, £974. We shot using my own Canon XL1S camera, grip equipment and lights, but we did have to buy one or two extra things. We purchased some halogen work lights and fluorescent tubes, which we used to light scenes alongside our redheads. Those came to £130. Light bulbs and gel, £237. Electrical cabling, mainly heavy duty 32 amp stuff to power our big 5k Fresnel, £88. One of the locations required all our equipment to be pat tested, that cost £42. Only one location charged us for the electricity we used, that was another £40. At many locations we had to use a generator, that cost £850 to hire. We bought some cheap tie clip mics for one particular scene, they cost £44. Mini DV tape stock, £349, we got through a lot of tapes. Film stock and developing for still photos, £236. The script called for one of the characters to drive a classic American convertible. By an amazing stroke of luck, one of the other actors owned a 1973 Mustang which he let us use. It cost £105 to insure, but that was only for use on location. So we had to spend a whopping £2,690 on flatbed recovery trucks to get it around. Several locations were going to charge us, but forgot and never invoiced us. We only ended up having to pay for two places, which came to £230. Public liability insurance, which was insisted on by many of the council-owned locations we used, cost £1,021. All the little stuff adds up over 35 days of shooting. Travel expenses, £3,959. Taxes, £114. Van hire, £625. Food and drink, £1,650. Accommodation, £2,317. We used an out-of-season holiday cottage most of the time, and B&Bs for the rest. Finally, £1,750 went in petty cash on countless little things like torch bulbs, gaffer tape, and last-minute props. I honestly have no idea how that figure got so big, but it just goes to show how many unexpected things come out of the woodwork on a long, difficult shoot. So the total for production was £19,311. So on now to post-production, which was very complex. We had miniatures of the Hades Express steam train and brewery vats to build, film and blow up. Stop motion sequences to animate involving Ezekiel's wings and the moat of souls. A banshee puppet to construct and shoot. And countless random elements like water and fish tanks, fireworks and even crumpled toilet paper to shoot for visual effects. Firstly, materials and consumables to build all these models and puppets, £857. To shoot the two big explosions, we brought in licensed pyrotechnicians and shot on Super 16 film so we could overcrank for proper slow motion. Hiring the Super 16 camera cost £106. The stock was £68 and the processing we got for free as it went with someone else's footage as part of a large batch. 
The actual pyrotechnics, including delivery, which has to be done by a specially licensed courier, came to £475. Wiring up the location with the necessary distribution to power our big 5k lamp cost £205. Most of the miniature train shots were filmed at a youth centre, hired at a cost of £95. Tape stock and blank DVDs for sending large files to effects artists, the composer and so on, £86. Buying movie soundtrack albums to create a temp score for the edit, £21. I recorded the vast majority of the film's sound effects myself, at pretty much zero cost, borrowing a microphone from a friendly local production company. But I did spend £6 on cabbages and a chicken for gross stabbing and bone-breaking effects. The sounds I wasn't able to record myself I purchased from libraries, at a cost of £79. One of the big coups of Soul Searcher was getting a 56-piece amateur orchestra to perform the score. We had to pay the orchestra a nominal fee, plus professional rates for the orchestra leader and the higher fee for the venue, a school hall. But all in all this came to just £810, but it raised the film's production values enormously. The sound mixer had his own garage studio, which we worked in pretty much around the clock for over a month, for only £200. Subsistence for post-production came to £91 travel expenses to £532, and van hire for the miniature shoots to £290. Our total for post-production, therefore, was £3,923. Finally, marketing and distribution. Even when your film is finished, your work's not over until you've signed a distribution deal and handed over the delivery materials. Lots of electronic press kits, trailers and screeners went out to press, festivals and distributors. On Soul Searcher I spent £130 on VHS dupes, as that was still the dominant format at the time, plus another £120 on blank DVDs, CDs and tapes for the copies I made at home. Thanks to the Creative Industries grant I was able to spend £1,113 on professional printing of press packs, flyers, posters and cover inlays. Postage of screeners, press packs and so on came to £162. The Soul Searcher website had been up and running since the earliest days of development, but it now became a vital marketing tool. As I built and maintained it myself, I only spent £112 on it over the course of the whole project, that being the cost of the domain name and hosting. Hiring a central London screening room for the cast and crew premiere cost £470, well worth it since it was attended by the Guardian writer responsible for the Spielberg of Hereford article. Which brings us to the £33 I spent on buying copies of the newspapers and magazines Soul Searcher appeared in. Attending the Cannes Film Festival and Market is essential for any filmmaker with a movie to sell. Adding up my flight, hotel, subsistence, phone credit and market pass gives us a total of £901 spent on this trip. Although in subsequent years I found ways to cut costs and did it for under £600 in 2011. Entry fees to other festivals, £409. Travel and subsistence for all the other meetings and screenings at this stage of the project came to £150. Finally, legal fees for looking over the distribution contract and lodging a copy of the film with the US Register of Copyright came to £267. So our total for marketing and distribution was £3,866 and our grand total for the whole project was £27,899. And now at last we come to the thorny issue of how much money the film actually made. So let me just explain briefly how selling a film works. Typically, you sell the domestic rights first, i.e. a license to screen the film in cinemas, sell copies on DVD and other formats, and broadcast it on TV in the UK. Then you sell the rights for the rest of the world to a sales agent who sells them on to numerous distributors in many other countries. Of course, both distributors and sales agents take a cut of the profits. So, 
As a result of sending out Soul Searcher screeners and making contacts at Cannes, four North American distribution companies expressed strong interest in buying at least some of the rights to Soul Searcher. But the only contract I was ultimately offered from that part of the world was from the Canadian company Cinema Vault. They have Vault in their name for a good reason. They wanted the rights for a period of 25 years as opposed to the more typical 3 to 5 years. Another unusual aspect of the deal, particularly for a micro-budget film with no-name actors, was that they offered an advance against the profits, 15,000 US dollars. The cut they're proposing to take of the profits was 25%, but remember, a distributor or sales agent will always make damn sure they recoup all their expenses, including suspiciously pricey trips to film markets and so on, before classifying anything as profits. In many ways, Cinema Vault's offer was very attractive, particularly the advance, but I was put off after meeting with them in Cannes. Initial talk of a cinema release was replaced by a plan for straight-to-DVD release, if it was ever released at all. Many of their films seemed to just sit in their catalogue and never see the light of day. Ultimately, none of the dialogues I initiated in Cannes led to any offers, despite several companies saying a contract was forthcoming and bandying around terms like theatrical release and spin-off TV series even. But before long I was approached by Wissiwig Films, a relatively new UK distributor who had seen Soul Searcher on Mandy.com's film marketplace. Wissiwig offered a deal with no advance but an attractive fixed royalty of £1 per UK DVD for the first 1,000 sold, and £2 per DVD after that. For overseas sales, where they would be acting as a sales agent, their cut was to be 25%, like Cinema Vault. But what was most appealing about Wissiwig's offer was their flexibility on delivery materials. Now, distributors don't just want a single master tape of your film, they want various different tape formats, international video standards and aspect ratios. They want various legal documents and insurance policies to protect them against any potential lawsuits. The list goes on and on. If I had signed Cinema Vault's contract, I would have spent far more than the $15,000 advance on producing these delivery materials. But Wissiwig were willing to negotiate on the list. And because of this, and their UK base, plus their willingness to let me author the DVD and create the bonus features the way I wanted, I signed with them. As a result, my expenditure on the delivery materials was negligible. Soul Searcher was released in the UK in August 2006. In December, I received my first report from Wissiwig showing that several hundred DVDs had been sold. And accordingly, a few weeks later, a cheque for £672 arrived. Unfortunately, the DVD sales dropped off very quickly, with only £94 coming in in the next quarter, followed by £23 and £13. Wissiwig believed DVD as a format in general was dead at this point, and they didn't push for any further sales in that medium, instead focusing on selling the film for online streaming and download. We received an £86 advance for this in autumn 2007, but online sales never reached a sufficient volume to pay us anything over this advance. Overseas sales were far more successful, but as the filmmaker I never saw any money from these. Despite assuring me they would distribute directly in the US, Wissiwig sold all the foreign rights to Loose Cannon, who released a US DVD and sub-licensed the rights to five additional countries, Japan, Benelux, Russia, Argentina and Thailand. As you can see, Loose Cannon received $34,200 from these deals, plus $4,382 from the US DVD sales. But since they claimed over $70,000 in expenses, they never had to pay anything onto Wissiwig or to me. So, as our five-year contract with Wissiwig draws to a close, Soul Searcher has only received an embarrassing £926 way, way under the £27,899 the film cost to make. I think there are several reasons for this pathetic performance. The lack of name actors in the film, the sloppy scripts, some dodgy effects, a very green distributor, and my own lack of experience and lack of interest in the film once it was creatively complete. Soul Searcher was a labour of love for me, but I'm disappointed I wasn't able to produce a return for the investors. It's not impossible for films in this budget range to make a profit, I've worked on at least one that has, 
but I think it takes hard work and a very pushy producer. Although those last figures were depressing, I hope you found some inspiration in this program as a whole. I'm sure you can see plenty of places you can improve on what I did, and I'd love to hear about your own projects. As for Soul Searcher, I'm planning my own release in 2012, where it will be available to view online for free, with a small extra charge to watch the extensive bonus features. To find out more, stay tuned to neilosman.com for all the latest information and inspiration for filmmakers everywhere. Goodbye.